Or with that, I'm going to discuss today a topic which I can't get away from, I have to say. It's just crazy. So the microbiome, and we'll talk about the microbiome and autoimmunity in a number of other settings. And I have to say this is a topic which, for one reason or another, I'm deeply immersed, and uh, I'm learning increasingly the relevance to many of the different uh, scientific pursuits that we have and increasing over time. I have to say two days ago, I was... Uh, called up uh, and asked to provide an opinion on a paper that was published yesterday in Science that looked at the microbiome and how it affects uh, lupus, to tell you the truth. And it's not my paper, but it's a different perspective. And it actually spoke to the fact that an anaerobic bacteria seems to leak out of the small bowel and cause inflammation in the liver and in people that are predisposed to autoimmunity. That's sort of the stimulus, kind of the adjuvant effect that drives autoimmunity. That may be relevant to lupus, but a number of other many diseases. I mean, I'm, I'm diverging, but let me just point out what this slide represents. And this is a young woman. Unfortunately, women are more uh, predisposed to development of autoimmune disease, and she is, she is uh, contemplating her alternate self. You can see the outline, and you can see all the different microbes that are there. And we're going to discuss the idea that, in fact, everything that we are, everything that we become, is influenced by our co-inhabitants, our microbiome, which we'll discuss. So our learning objective is, is include to understand the human immune system and that we co-evolved in the presence of the microbiome. We're not meant to be in a sterile environment. There are a diversity of microbes that are in us and on us on a, every uh, surface. I have to say, I was uh, visiting a medical center in Chicago, and I was talking to someone who I newly met, and he was a PhD uh, microbiologist, and I, he was telling me about what his contribution to the world was, and he was very excited to share with me was that he had finally countered public opinion and proven, without a doubt, that urine is not sterile. And I said, that's great, that's great, that's really helping me. <laughs> But at, you know, at a certain level, there is biomass within us and on us on every level. There is no such thing as truly sterile environment. Uh, I thought about it for a while, and I remembered that, in fact, just as uh, William was mentioning, we long know that every time we get our teeth cleaned, we have a shower of bacteria that go through our bloodstream, which is the compartment that must stay sterile, but it's not always sterile, and there's something that you can detect there all the time. Uh, and, but what does it mean, and what is the diversity of these bugs uh, doing? What is their communities? And so there are a range of functions associated with the influence of the microbiome. And again, this is a diverse community. We'll talk more about it. But the point is that imbalances or dysbioses can contribute to, to many different clinical diseases. And I have to say it's just astonishing. Perhaps there, there are a few conditions that are not influenced. So we'll teach a little bit about the biology and a little bit about the terminology. So the point is that we undergo embryogenesis in a sterile environment, but shortly after arriving in this exciting, dirty world, we are colonized by diverse microbial communities. And in fact, the birth canal is prepared with altered flora that shifts as mom is about ready to give birth. And it is really essential that this first exposure that actually will lead to colonization of our surfaces and our GI tract, that in fact, this is a sequence as the communities become more diverse. But to say in other studies, people are concerned that cesarean section that delivers you without going through the birth canal interrupts this at the earliest stage, and that that may actually alter your immune defenses. And it's particularly disconcerting because uh, cesarean section, some people sort of consider it sort of a weird uh, sign of affluence. In Brazil, up to 50% of people are delivered by cesarean section. Why? Because it's all under control, right? It won't, isn't just this natural event that gets away from you. You can schedule all of your appointments. You can bring your dry cleaning in. You can then get your, have your tennis game, and then you go to the hospital having a baby on schedule, I guess. But in fact, that's not the way that things were meant to be. And, and babies that are colonized after cesarean section get, their GI tracts are colonized with skin flora. And the first exposures that you have actually determines what goes next. And it turns out that in your, I just read a paper that was in Nature that said that what determines the composition of these diverse communities we have in our GI tract? Well, 
It actually is to very little degree they say genetics. It's really about environment and it's who you hang out with. So 20% of your bugs you share with your first degree relatives, the people that you live with. If you live with animals, you know they love to share. So, <laughs> and, and, and what these balance or imbalances represent, we'll talk about different examples. But we evolved with this microbiota. This is not something imposed on us. It's not a dirty thing. If it weren't for bugs, we wouldn't be here. Our immune systems wouldn't develop, to tell you the truth. We wouldn't be ready to deal with real external threats. And amongst the tools that have been developed, let me just say that Joshua Lederberg, uh, Nobel laureate, he coined this term microbiome, you know, which is... Let me just point out that Joshua Lederberg did not coin... <laughs> Um, okay. He popularized it. He popularized it. Okay. All right. So we'll just move on. <laughs> Anyone in the audience as well can correct me at any juncture. <laughs> in during this talk or any time, just call me up. I know my wife has taken to that. Um, okay. So the point is, how do you figure out the influence of individual bugs or, or communities or combinations? The development of notobiotics allows us to actually raise our animals, small animal models, uh, in environments where they are, have none. And I, then you can, in a reductionistic fashion, add back bacteria and see what happens, or small communities called consortia. And then we can analyze uh, the relevance, not just of the different uh, taxa, as we'll describe, but in fact what their metabolic capacities are. We can, in fact, take their entire genetic material and analyze it through next generation sequencing, computational analysis, and figure out what they're set up for. So this has really changed the way we think about things. So we all contain a zoo. How many microbial cells do we have? A bunch. So this says up to 100 trillion microbial cells. And in each of us, in our intestines, the largest communities, this isn't the only communities, largest communities are in our intestines, and each of us generally has about a thousand or more species, and people have bandied about what the real uh, relationship between the number of microbial cells to, to human cells is. And we think that there are at least three times more bugs than human cells. If you watch Star Trek, that means that we are all composite entities, but we have a minority vote if we think we're the humans. But the point is that the communities can shift very, very dramatically, and, there are, and there, the genetic composition, what genes, are in these microbes are much greater than ours. We only have like 20, 25 genes that encode for proteins and other functions in our bodies as humans, but these bugs have 100 times more. They can shift their relative representation of these different genes so they can take advantages of alterations in their environment. You know, let's say what, some days I'm on a banana thing, so then they adapt to break down all the fiber and everything else in bananas, and other times I may go on a liquid diet, whatever that means, and uh, so on and so forth. They're shifting back and forth, adapting better than we can. It's been argued that, of course, many of these bugs are anaerobes, and difficult to culture. Let me just point out that all of us were mis misled in medical school when they told us that E. coli is just like such an important uh, keystone bug in our guts. And I have to say that the, they send these guys all out to every beach, especially in San Diego after it rains, and they say, the coliforms, the coliforms, don't go in the water. But in us, E. coli are only about 1% or so of the community. So they're just a little itsy-bitsy part of it. Most of this are anaerobes. Uh, they uh, metabolize by a very different environment. Uh, at the ACR, I, last I gave a plenary session where we were talking about our own work that linked a particular bacteria, the pathogenesis of lupus nephritis, so we are arguing that, that factors within the microbiome are the strongest environmental influences. Genetically predisposed people don't necessarily get the disease. I treated a number of people that have lupus that have identical twins that don't have lupus. It just goes to show you it's not all in the genetics. So I'm not going to talk about that at great length. What are the functions of the intestinal microbiome? They break down everything that we eat. They actually alter it and they synthesize essential vitamins. In some cases, they'll break down fibers and carbohydrates to immune modulating factors. Even simple things like amino acids uh, can be used as the building blocks and be um, subjected to enzymatic uh, 
factors or breakdown factors that actually are directly affecting T cell subsets, expanding them, reducing, inducing regulatory T cells. So the, uh, the bugs actually are determining what goes on. And they've developed this terminology in, in when we look closer and closer whether or not an individual bacterial uh, species, if, if it's present in excess, even though it's a commensal and it's part of what we are, and a symbiont, if it has pathologic properties when it's in excess, it can become a pathobiont. So pathobionts in the wrong person at the wrong time are bad, and they may or may not be balanced out by the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, bugs that are called protectors. Okay, so this is just to go show you what a popular topic this is. I'll look over here. I, th I think this was meant to be an emoji, but we all know what it really represents. <laughs> I had a friend that used to send me this emoji, and it's like my eyesight's not that great. I said, what is that brown triangly thing? I'm not sure. <laughs> and my friend said, that's you, Greg. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, so, but the point is, what is actually in our intestines and most of it is bacteria, very little of it are our own cells, shown here as colonocytes. But there's, there are different types of viruses, fungi, and many, and protists as well. So it's really a very complex community, and if it gets out of balance, uh, it, you're in trouble. And this is just going to show you how popular this topic is. Number of papers on the microbiome just increasing and increasing and increasing until it'll take over the whole page, so I had to stop somewhere. All right, so you're going to focus and you're going to look at we assign the identity of these bacteria by looking at their DNA sequence. The primary means is by a single gene, they've decided, uh, originally used to identify tuberculosis in patients. But if you actually look at the variations in the sequence of the 16S ribosomal gene, you can determine uh, what phyla, order, class, family, and genus of bacterial pieces just by 150 base pairs. And you can assign to many different uh, the factors with, or families and genes, excuse me, and bacteria within it. And this is just an example how the microbiome differs between different anatomic sites, from stool to cheek to plaque in our, our teeth, uh, tongue, nose, and so on and so forth. And a number of different bugs have been identified that play roles in health and disease. Uh, staph epidermidis on all of our skin, uh, lactobacillus species, which can be uh, anti-inflammatory, and strep, and so on. I'm going to talk about some of these examples. So not all bugs are bad, and I have to say that I think within a few years, they're going to have to change the specialty of infectious disease because it'll be important to understand these microbes, but they aren't all pathogenic. And also this paradigm I want you to unlearn, which is don't think necessarily about the bugs that anytime someone comes in and ill, you're going to find one bug causing that disease, and you must demolish it. That's that you'll get into worse trouble in the long term. It's all about balance. Marty Blazer wrote a very popular, well-received uh, book. Uh, Marty is at NYU, formerly the chairman of medicine, The Missing Microbes. And so he, it was his assertion that many of the diseases and conditions that are increasingly common in our society have to do with our hyperhygienic approach to life and that we are too indiscriminate in the use of antibiotics, and that this has actually shifted within each of us what the dynamic communities are, and that, that we may be losing different bugs that are really essential for keeping balance. And if you want to compare, you can go and look at the vegetarians that will live in Indonesia or Bali or someplace, and you can see that although they grossly have the same number of bugs, uh, and in many cases, some similarities in the balance between aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, uh, those particular entities that are there, many have been lost from our communities. So what does this mean? So hopefully you've heard of this idea about this, that we're causing, we're afflicting ourselves through hyper hygiene. And on a very simple level, you can look at the triumph of modern medicine against microbes, and that over time, there are many conditions, uh, and these are both bacterial uh, illnesses and viral illnesses that are decreasing over time. Rheumatic fever with the introduction of uh, antibiotics. Tuberculosis, not gone, but the very or less common in our society. But the point is, maybe all the influences are not bad. 
And maybe also, as we're killing some of these bugs, we're causing other distortions, because there's a superimposed trends in the other direction for increasing in auto, uh, autoimmune disease and allergic diseases. And so this is, you know, correlation is not causation, but there are concerns about this. And there may be another type of epidemic which actually has similar parallels that I'll get to in a minute. This is a slide I stole from Noah Palm, which I rather like. So when we are born, our, our bowels are sterile and we really don't have much going on immunologically in our intestines. You should realize that the system is really designed to have an immune response in place within the mucosa that actually keeps the localization of gut bacteria and keeps them doing things that are helpful. But you need exposure during colonization to actually stimulate the activation of the immune system, which starts out in your bowel and to a large degree spreads throughout your body to actually maintain vigilance and ability to defend against uh, later threats. And so again, pathogenic bacteria are inherently a problem, but other commensals are symbiotic with uh, the host. And uh, it's, it's only if there are imbalances or you have some some uh, predisposing genetics that they may elicit if they get in the wrong combination a disease. So here's a great example, which I find very powerful. Hopefully it's well known to everybody in the audience. When I went to medical school, the number one diagnosis that was an indication for abdominal surgery throughout the United States was Peptic ulcer disease. So they were really good at it at that point. They just sort of slice and dice, take off the top of your stomach, decrease the amount of acid secreting cells, and then you'd have all kinds of uh, doctor induced complications, but it was the best way of treating it, right? Otherwise, nobody wants to die of a bleeding ulcer. And the miraculous thing that happened when I was a junior and first on the wards was the approval of a mind boggling medication that now is over the counter. Uh, cimetidine. So they realized that a surgical disease could be managed just by taking a tablet a couple times a day that decreased your stomach acidity, and so things were good. We, so we transform a surgical disease to a medical disease that is just managed. And But lo and behold, shortly thereafter, these two wild Australians, Robin Warren and Barry Marshall, said, you know, We've been looking at these stomachs, and there's some bacteria going on in there. And, and the, the medical community said, that cannot be true. It's a sterile organ. It's sterile. And literally, there was great contentiousness. These are very attractive uh, helicobacter pylori. Aren't they really great? I think this is terrific. Uh, Marty Blazer has a big poster on his door. You go see him, you can be inspired to looking at the bugs, looking you right in the eye. So point, the point was the first observations were made in 1982, and the world was very, very reticent to accept this. It wasn't until 14 years later that the FDA said, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe we should just get rid of that bug, and maybe we'll decrease peptic ulcer disease, which is causing such uh, morbidity in the community. So we'll actually suggest that people instead uh, use a antibiotic regimen, difficult to kill this bug, Kind of a little bit ridiculous to tell you the truth because you go and take your regimen, then you know three days later you kiss your girlfriend and psh, you're back where you started. <laughs> but the point is that they reduce surgery by 88 percent, and this is kind of the problem where not I mean many many people will have Helicobacter pylori, but only few people have symptoms. Uh, there I read a very interesting paper that if you ha if you happen to be a, a teenage boy in Bangladesh. No, I don't want to offend anybody, so I had to ask first. So uh, you're actually protected if you have H. pylori from getting uh, invasive um, uh, amoebic disease. So in fact, on one level, bad news, and the other level, good news. The recurrent theory, I think. Um, and so in I think the hyperacidity actually helped to reduce how much amoeba, your food that you eat, would actually be able to get into your bowel and uh, therefore potentially cause disease. So it's all about a balance, and it makes you wonder, how many courses of antibiotics do you need until you're really in trouble? Because this is what you're going to get, maybe. So Clostridia difficile, this is, this is just an epidemic. It's absolutely horrendous. 
This was a disease that was often life-threatening. People would be, go to the hospital, stay there weeks and weeks and months and months, and by correlation it was known it was related to broad-spectrum antibiotics. And then we discovered that it actually had to do with wiping out your entire microbiome. And this one bug that's always there, just going, hey, what's up, but you know, it likes to stay in a group, it actually became greatly expanded. There were arguments, is it a bad strain that makes a toxin? Now we think they all, that all strains of this common bug can make it. It's just if it becomes expanded. So if you just level the playing field and knock down all of your flora by a couple of orders of magnitude, in some people, this actually becomes expanded. This horrible bug, Clostridia difficile, very attractive. Well, you know, there's an irony because there's a theory that was proposed just this year that it is not just an accident of antibiotics that we are having this C. difficile epidemic. Yet again, we did it to ourselves. Somebody really clever made some kind of a food additive called uh, trahalos, trahalos, sounds like a, should be making it in Hawaii, trahalos. Um, and basically, it was added to change the consistency of food. I think it's a little bit sweeter, and basically was, was introduced in the year 2000 broadly in processed foods. And what they found was that in uh, archive samples, that there were strains that almost immediately became prevalent that developed the biochemical pathway to use trahalose as a nutritional uh, base for their own metabolism. And so they argue, and uh, it's at Baylor College, but a number of other places have uh, investigated this, they argued that we brought it upon ourselves, that we actually started changing the, the nutritional substance that made this expansion of this potentially life-threatening um, Bug. So I have to say, there's, there's whatever is terrible you can find an approach, and the idea is we must reestablish balance. And now, approved therapy for C. difficile colitis is actually reestablishing a balance in your microbiome. And we do this through fecal microbiota transplants. It's really great. So if you want to get rid of those pesky purple and green bacteria, then you put some of this in, and it all gets straightened out. So it's very simple. And I have to say that I was reading through, you know, the Wikipedia, you know, the source of all knowledge. And they had yet a section that said, the Chinese have been doing this for 3,000 years. They always say that. It's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you think, well, you know, somebody impulsively in ancient China said, you know, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> but... Uh, so transplants actually can have up to 98% efficacy, and otherwise what we're doing is just treating people with broader and broader antibiotics to knock down the C. difficile, but it can really be remarkable, and now they're just messing with the formulations. 80% uh, response rates up to 18 months later. So this is coming into uh, common practice. Uh, I, was, I went to a talk by, this is actually the rather um, Eric Pamer. So Eric Pamer, I went to a talk, and... Someone was completely brilliant how they were explaining the microbiome and fecal transplants and all the theory behind it. And I thought to myself, that voice is so familiar. And I closed my eyes and I remembered he was my intern when I was a resident. So now he's head of ID at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he's actually pioneered a lot of these studies. But, you know, the question is, who are you going to get this transplant from? You know, it's a little, little dicey, you know. And I have to say, most people say, I don't know, my, my spouse... It's like, that's a great idea. Well, Eric has a really great idea because you get treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics when you get bone marrow transplants. So there, it's a factory, it's Sloan Kettering, causing people to have pseudomembranous colitis. But what they're doing is self-banking. So you go in, you, you deposit in the bank, and you'll be ready afterward to restore your balance. And I, I thought that was just brilliant. Heart, few and, so it's a miracle, a miracle... <laughs> Sometimes in a bottle. I just got these images off the web. Um, but, you know, I literally turned in an editorial yesterday to a journal because the first week of January, there are three papers in science back to back to back. And what they actually described was new insights into the use of checkpoint inhibitors. So we all know about immune checkpoint inhibitors. Yes, are you with me so far? It's really miraculous. 
the promise of immunologic-based therapy for the treatment of advanced cancer had been sort of considered and discussed with really puny results for years and years and years. And what they basically discovered uh, is that there are pathways immunologically for suppressing overactive immune responses. But we figured it out only recently. Apparently the cancer figured it out a long time ago. And so cancers often secrete factors that turn off immune defenses and put your T cells to sleep. And it also has to do with how many mutations you have in the cancer. So basically an antibody that blocks the inhibitory pathway through PD-1 or CKLA-4 basically can wake up your immune system and then you start attacking your tumor and the response rates uh, are limited, I have to say, maybe only 20 to 30 percent, but they're looking at better agents. But those people can have remarkable responses for advanced melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, uh, uh, stomach cancer, non-small cell cancer, really the horrible, terrible cancers that we have done poorly with. But they said, well, what is it that interferes with responsiveness? You know, I mean, I put my money up, I want to get my response. Well, they found that where most people are non-responders, and some of it has to do with tumor intrinsic factors, maybe they don't have the mutations that an a, uh, immune cell, a T cell, would recognize, they found that a large percentage of the people that are non-responders had gotten an antibiotic by their doctor two months before and wiped out their microbiome, and then they started dissecting which bugs within your bowel you need for immune activation. So, and now they're thinking about what it is that would really activate your immune system. And so, it's one thing to th think about how to make a better antibody or regimen, but it's really just the world within us that's turned to maybe the major determinant of the bugs there activating the immune system to attack the tumor. So, it's really quite remarkable. Okay. So, one of the last points I want to make is that it turns out that a lot of these immune modulatory effects are all around us. So we have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes, and there's now papers that suggest that the common drugs in use, many of them, may in fact act not just directly on our cells with regard to glucose tolerance, but may actually change your microbiome that then secondarily affects your, your uh, glucose tolerance. So for metformin, that is true, and a number of other uh, agents are described and they're modulating other biochemical pathways for single-chain fatty acid production, which is also anti-inflammatory. So there may be a lot of things going on. And, you know, if you follow the literature, metformin is in trials for looking at a lot of other potential in inflammatory diseases, too. And how can that be? This may be the common pathway. So this part is accepted. So, of course, you know, it isn't that you go to McDonald's and uh, it's just it's all your gut's fault, right? And your gut bugs. And let me just, I just wanted to mention something else, which is, you know, I, I like Diet Coke. I think, I can't stand original. It tastes weird. Ugh. But, you know, I, I like the, I, Tony Fauci, you know, who's the, who's the head of the NIAID, he had this thing for tab. He'd have cases of tab. That was the only thing that tasted good to him. And I think they had saccharin in it. It was just kind of crazy. But, you know, the point is they make these non-nutritional sweeteners but they're non-nutritional sweeteners for human cells. But what about those bugs? So what they're actually finding is that they did studies initially that found that, that children that drink dietary soft drinks, diet soft drinks, get fat. Say, what's with that? They're not supposed to. Well, it turns out that there are bugs in our microbiomes that can actually break down the non-nutritional sweeteners into components that then our body absorbs, and we get fat. So it's like... Just drink water, you know? <laughs> and let me just, my last comment is that there are great opportunities in the future for changing our, our gut flora. I'm not signing up for transplants. I, I do walk our dogs frequently, and I think that they give me transfers on a more limited basis. I was just telling somebody this. I was over in the park with the dogs, and I said, you know, everybody, you know, I'm leaning over to do something with the dog, and... and uh, Everybody, if you raise your children with pets, they have a lower incidence of allergy. And I'm saying, so it probably has to do with a transfer.
Somebody, another dog, I never saw before in my life, ran over and kissed me on the mouth, and I went, oh my God. I, I, there, I have a commonality with every, every small animal that's ever been in this park now. It's crazy. <laughs> But, you know, I don't know what you're supposed to do about it. I don't really think I need a transfer or a transplant. But apparently, that doesn't stop our wonderful consumer society. So this is not from the web. This is from the Walgreens down the block, where I couldn't even get all the things on the counter for probiotics. Uh, on the, on, and it's like, what the hell do these things do? Some things may not be too bad, but it's just crazy. They're all fighting for shelf space. So you can go and work on your probiotic biotic treatment and you can come back and tell me what happens because I don't really get it. You know, I thought the whole idea of colon health, I think that you should have a new campaign, but I'm not really sure how you go about doing that. All right, so hopefully you found some of this uh, intriguing and I just, my party and shots are that the co-evolution uh, co with the human immune system has endowed intestinal microbiome with many essential roles in metabolism. So you need them. You wouldn't be here without them. You know, you put a baby in a sterile uh, bubble and, and, and suppress all microorganisms, uh, and the, the child will wither. So there are more than 20,000 species that have been associated with different people's bowels and surfaces around the world. Each of us has about 1,000. So there's, they're not identical, and the variations may be very important. The idea is when they get out of whack, and actually with contracted microbiomes where you don't really have that many species, it's easier for somebody who should be suppressed in the community to get expanded. We don't really understand how these steps come about. We're always having sort of oscillations all the time. I once went to a, a, a talk where a guy talked about his world travels and he collected his samples on a weekly basis and analyzed them. Something happened to him in Thailand. It was really crazy. But he didn't feel very well at the time, and his microbes uh, were out of balance, but he came back afterward. So these developing insights are offering new therapeutic opportunities, as well as the identification of previously unsuspected mechanisms of action, such as metformin is what I'm referring to. So we may be modulating our microbiomes routinely with our, our Western medicines, uh, and we don't even know how they act. But uh, I think as we delve deeper into this topic, I think that there's a lot of good things that we can do. So I appreciate your attention.